Hey, all right, very good. Well, uh, oh, we jumped forward too far. Here we are. Um, I do volunteer time down at Antietam, where most of you have been. Uh, if you have not heard about it, every year, the first Saturday in uh, December, we have an illumination, which is be coming up in a couple months here, where they distribute 23,000 uh, illumination uh, lights, luminaries, out across the battlefield. And uh, uh, it's quite a staggering thing to see. If you ever go, I call it the most horrifying and beautiful thing you'll ever see. Um, yes, it does. It gives you plenty of time for contemplation, as we like to say. Uh, uh, 23,000, we'll, we'll talk about them in a second, 23,000 for the number of casualties on the battlefield. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's horrifying from that aspect to see so many young men's lives who were changed irrevocably, uh, either killed, wounded, or captured. Only, only about, uh, sorry, only about uh, a little under 4,000 actually died on the battlefield that day. Uh, but you know, the rest of us were casualties, a staggering number. Um, but it's aesthetically, when you look at it, it's just amazing to see this grid, six feet by six foot grid across the battlefield. That's, uh, when you come around through that, you'll see two campfires, one for the Confederate side, one on the good guy side, and the Union side up on the north end of the field. And um, uh, it's one of the high points of my year is to go there and just sort of stand watch over the battlefield and, uh, and sort of mark the space uh, for those men. I also teach high school history at Broadford Christian Academy outside of Hagerstown. Uh, I've been doing that since 2000. Uh, they were in desperate need of a free teacher, and uh, they hired me. <laughs> Um, I did not go to school to a teacher. I did go to teacher school, so I don't know all the lingo sometimes. And other teachers will say, blah, 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 out of some you know, jargon, rather than I just kind of give them like, no hablo. <laughs> um, uh, my wife, however, has taught in public school for a long, long time, and she translates for me, which is great. Uh, I keep showing up, and they keep paying me, so here I am. Uh, I was actually trained as a family therapist, uh, so my voice is trained to speak in soft, empathic tones at a voice distance of about six feet. So. If at any point my voice drops too slow, you know, too low, uh, just let me know and I'll try to pick it up a little bit. I, I'm, I'm learning to project still. Um, I, I put Renaissance Man there. I'm, I'm awfully hard to describe. I like to tell stories. I like to ramble around both on the internet and in real space. And um, I'm just kind of perpetually curious about everything. So uh, hopefully that will come through here in a productive manner. Um, I, I have many persona. Uh, this is a film we did for... Uh, uh, the War That Made America, it's called, it's on PBS for just about 12 or 13 years ago now, uh, and it's about the French and Indian War uh, in the 1750s and 60s, and that's not actually my hair, the, the makeup is a, is a wonderful thing, wardrobe, and that was taken on the Gettysburg uh, battlefield, I do tours of Gettysburg and Antietam, uh, don't do them for pay, I only do them for friends, so if you want to be my friend, come and take a tour. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm delighted to do that, always, uh, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, this is Dr. Joseph Rothrock. You may notice some slight similarity. Uh, Joseph, Joseph Rothrock, if you don't know, is the father of forestry in Pennsylvania. He started what's now the Mount Alto campus, and he and I bear some, some resemblance. His time frame is a little later than some folks. That's more closer to the age I am now. He was in his 75, I think, when that was taken. So, uh, he lost a little weight somewhere along the line. Uh, and we were discussing, some of us were talking earlier about he's wearing uh, uh, leggings here uh, from back then. Kind of interesting character. Um, you can also get that image on a cell phone case. If you, if you, <laughs> the times in which we live. <laughs> um, but we, I came to, it was invited to speak primarily about Antietam, uh, and uh, so I've, I've sort of focused on that. Uh, if you go to Gettysburg, you know, we talk about Gettysburg, you can't the word. Gettysburg has probably made the most dramatic changes in its forestry and its management of the battlefield. Uh, but uh, since Antietam is so close, and I, I know it. Uh, so well, I thought I'd sort of focus on that. Uh, it was uh, actually begun about 1890, which is uh, quite a some few years. Ago. The actual date of the battle is 1862. So we're talking something on the order of uh, what's that, uh, 60 years? No, uh, 30 years. Uh, afterwards, it was trans. It was originally it was under the auspices of the U.S. War Department, Defense Department in those days. Transferred in 1933 uh, into what had become the Park Service by that point. And the visitor center that you see there now was constructed in 1962. This is the, uh, uh, the Maryland campaign. Uh, this battle takes place uh, in the fall of 1862. Uh, Lee is moving his forces up out of Virginia to get the, the, uh, the, the Yankees up out of Virginia so they can't destroy the crops for the stores there. And um, uh, 
his plans are foiled by the discovery of one of his orders, and a battle takes place on South Mountain on September the 14th, uh, 1862, and then the actual Battle of Antietam takes place three days later. It, the battle is in three phases, the north part of the field, the center part of the field, and the south part of the field, and um, uh, that's sort of briefly the, the, the plan. I, I had a map here, but it's kind of in the dark, and it's kind of small for you to see. If you want to come up afterwards and take a look at that, I've got that. I've got a couple of books up here, which are sort of then and now uh, pictures of it, which are kind of fun to see. Uh, Bill Fresnel started doing this at the Gettysburg and did a really good job of, of uh, documenting where some of these iconic photos like this were taken. Now, this is pretty easy because this is the Dunker Church. If you're familiar with the battlefield, you've probably seen the Dunker Church and the Confederate casualties from the artillery batteries that were there. This is along the Hagerstown Pike on the north end of the field. Uh, the actual pike is over here. This is actually a track that's worn in, in, the, in, the, in the grass. And these are some of the Confederate dead that were unburied there when Mr. Gardner stood up with his camera uh, working for Mr. Brady out of New York. A, a, um, editorial was in the New York Times after uh, Brady began to display these photographs. He said, if Mr. Brady has not brought the dead from Antietam and laid them on our doorstep, he's done something very much like it. The carnage of the battlefield was something only people who had been at the battlefield could see until photography came along. And so we got to look at uh, images like this for the very first time, and it, it horrified people, and it should. Uh, this is horrifying stuff. I get choked up even thinking about it. Uh, horrible. Well, um, this is sort of a little bit of the, the uh, an, an image that was taken from 1988. The, the battlefield did a sort of, what can we see? What's the view shed look like? And uh, here you can see the outline of the battlefield itself. Here's the town of Sharpsburg. Um, the Potomac River follows along here. Antietam Creek is over here, uh, kind of the orient South Mountain is along here. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Antietam Creek is here. This is South Mountain. And uh, it gives you an idea of some of the view sheds take place. As I said, there's a morning phase, a midday phase, and an afternoon phase. Um, uh, it basically starts off in the north, works in the, in the center, in the, in the middle of the day, and at the south end of the field uh, down here. It covers quite a bit of territory, several miles from one end to the other. This is a, a pretty big battle space. Um, on September, September 18th, the day after, there's a truce between the two sides, uh, and they do some trading across the lines. They pick up the wounded, and that evening, Lee escapes south across the Potomac River, and much to the consternation of those in the north uh, who think that uh, General McClellan, the Union commander, should have uh, nailed him to the ground right there, but he gets away. And this is a very near pristine battlefield, which is very much like it did the day before the battle. There are very few modern buildings, very few intrusions on the landscape from uh, modern uh, uh, objects of any sort. Uh, it's not near an interstate. If you go down the Newmarket Battlefield, the, the Newmarket Battlefield, you cut right to the middle by Interstate 81. Uh, we have nothing like that here at Antietam. So you begin to really see the battle space, the battlefield, as it was at the time. Um, it's largely uncluttered by monuments. There are some, but not a lot. You go to Gettysburg, the largest collection of outdoor statuary in the world, uh, and you can see um, uh, all kinds of statuary, and sometimes it's hard to see the uh, I've done a lot of living history for a long time, and uh, people will come sometimes and ask questions, which you can tell they really haven't thought through carefully. Like, you know, why are there monuments here? And it's so the soldiers knew where to stand. Um, are you going to eat that? Yeah. Um, uh, our, our favorite question is back to them is, you know, you know why all the Civil War battles were fought in national parks? <laughs> Because the, it's because the camping is free. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> the town of Sharpsburg has a very different attitude towards its battlefield than Gettysburg does. No slight against the other town, they're just either town. They're just very different places. Uh, Gettysburg, as soon as the guns went silent, tried to begin to make a buck off of it. The town had been devastated. The farms for miles around had been devastated. They needed some kind of income, I understand. Uh, same sort of thing happens in Sharpsburg, but in Sharpsburg they planted trees between the train station and the battlefield. So the relatives who came to see it and visit the cemetery could walk in the shade. Very different attitude towards the battle space the battlefield. Um, as you, if you, may, you may pick up, I'm, I'm, I, I like them too, for, for many reasons, and one of them is the town. People who live there are lovely. Okay. 
Um, this is uh, having to do with some of the view shed stuff. Um, this was done in 1988. Today, today we could do it on our own cell phone. Uh, but they began to look at what can you see from the visitor center in terms of trying to preserve the view shed, not just the, the ground in the park itself, but the landscape around it so you don't have high rises on the edge of the park. And they've been pretty successful at doing that. Um, this one in particular, you can see if you look closely, the topography they've been able to look at and shade the topography to show you exactly what you can see from any point, uh, in this case, on the, the visitor center. Um, this is a blow up of what you could see in the upper quadrant of that. And this is Elk Ridge down here and uh, parts of South Mountain visible. You can see uh, Antietam Creek is right in here. And the Potomac is off the image to the right. Um, how do we know what's there in 1862? If we're going to restore a battlefield or preserve a battlefield, how do you know what's where? Well, we've got a couple things going for us. People at that time were very invested in making maps. One of the things we had to do was maneuver an awful lot of people. And if you don't have a map to know where you are and where so-and-so is, it's hard to had to maneuver things on the field. So map making and cartography were very important to the original cast. Um, and they did a good job of that. So we have original uh, maps that, that help out quite a bit. We have photographs, as I mentioned. Uh, Mr. Gardner shows up, uh, and he's able to uh, photograph. From that, we're able to, to show where lines were open, vegetation, fence lines, housing, that sort of thing. And we have people who do paintings. If you visit the Antietam battlefield, You'll see in the basement in the museum there are four very large paintings. Each one's bigger than those two uh, glass spaces there, which show the battlefield. And, and they were done within years after the battle, so that you could get a sense from that what it looked like. Archaeological evidence uh, the, at the Piper Farm in Antietam, they were able to go find where the where the apple trees and where the all the different trees were in the orchard, uh, and they were able to reconstruct now the orchard. Uh, so you're actually seeing the orchard as it were owned by the Piper family at the time of the battle. Uh, and we have people who've just lived there a long time. But yeah, my grandfather was here. He was a little bit when the battle happened. He told me wasn't so clear. So we've got a living chain of oral history of people who are on the land still connected, invested in it. Uh, and that's helpful too. Um, this is a, a reconstruction from a multitude of sources. This hangs in the, uh, the bookstore at Antietam. And it's uh, sort of the larger part of the northern half of the battlefield. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody paid the bill. Uh, uh, this is the larger part, uh, larger view of it. I, I blew it up a little bit. This is the part I want to focus on, the northern part of the field. The Miller Cornfield, the east woods, the north woods, which is just up there, and the west woods over here. Uh, and show you how some, you can see here where the east woods uh, lines, the, the, comes in line with the cornfield and comes down and hits uh, uh, Smoketown Road. And you can see out behind the West Woods there is a solid forest back out towards this, this direction. Um, I didn't get a good shot of the north end of that. But this is the kind of landscape you would have seen had you been there in 1862. Uh, narrow dirt roads, nothing paved, uh, some rather large trees, although this one's dead, you can tell, and open ground under the trees, a rather mature forest, not a lot of undergrowth showing there. Uh, because animals ran loose during that time period, hogs and other animals, would root up uh, small uh, seedlings and so on and so forth and keep the forest fairly open and clear in most areas. Unlike today, they would let their animals run free quite a bit and they would fence out the animals. They wouldn't uh, fence them in. Uh, and so uh, uh, that was both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, at Antietam, there are accounts of the hogs going after the wounded after the battle. Yeah, not a pretty sight. Mm -hmm. um, here is an aerial photograph from Google Earth. I live in Google Earth. I love this. My kids in school think, oh, no, not Google Earth again. <laughs> but this is an image from 1988. Uh, I put a marker here where the East Woods uh, will be right along here. This field right now is what's been reforested. You can see it's changed from uh, straw to, to, to green as that's been, we're going to look at it in a bit uh, a little closer on the ground. Um, this is blown up a little bit. You can see it a little bit closer. Uh, and there it is, as of two years ago, three years ago. You can see we've been planting trees in here and it's beginning to mature and reclaim that space with that same edge to the field as it has been in 1862. <laughs> Again, back to the bigger image. The north woods is up in here, uh, and the, uh, the west woods is over here. We're going to get some north woods. 
Here you see it in uh, 2000, excuse me, 1988. Uh, this open field, it's all mowed and or tilled uh, and or uh, pasture. Uh, nothing there. Uh, there's no trees in the north woods. Uh, well, this is the beginning of the reforestation of the north woods. Uh, it's not complete yet, but they begin to fill in that space uh, by planting uh, seedlings in there. There's another angle of the area. But I think it's about 2007 later. Um, again, so we east Eastwoods, Northwoods, and now we're going to go into the Westwoods. And here's the monument. Uh, the, I think it was the Excelsior Brigade. Uh, no, uh, in here, and the walkways, and here's the fence line. And you can see how that's begun to fill back in. It's very dramatic. Uh, I began my experience planting trees at Antietam in this field in 2003. And we're out there digging away, and I had some kids at that time who were not really the most well behaved and they were just being killed. And so some of the staff took them over to sit in the shade and, and sort of nail them down. Meanwhile, the rest of us and the good kids are out there in the sun and working like dogs. And we're like, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Shouldn't you be out here working? Um, uh, but uh, all of what we planted failed. Every single one of the trees we planted out there just died. And so they came back a couple years later and we have been able to reestablish that. This area in here, uh, I was shocked when I went out there yesterday uh, to see some pretty uh, well-developed trees out there, and you'll see them in a second. Uh, this is the East Woods before they began planting. Uh, I believe this is from 19, uh, 2006 or 7. Uh, here's an aerial view as they began to replant. You can see all the little uh, tubes down here stuck to the stake. And, just freshly planted. Here's the, the Miller's cornfield. Here's the Northwood starting to fill in up here. And the Westwoods is over that way. Uh, this is the Eastwoods looking from uh, basically this direction, this way, sort of northeastish. And you can see this is uh, winter time. It's uh, been filled in with uh, the tubes, what had been an open field. Uh, this I took yesterday. Uh, it's quite an amazing success story. They've been able to turn an open field into a young forest through some hard work. Uh, this is my pun, locust busting out of its cocoon. Treating the um, And this is standing from farther west and back at the east woods. And this is all the area that had been open field and is now being reforested, reestablishing not only the tree line, but the, but the forest that had been there at the time of the battle. Um, so how do you restore a landscape to its 1862 condition? You have to use a little back. There it is. Uh, if, you, if you ever go to Antietam, uh, the Pry House has a museum in it for of Civil War medicine, and they sell those. And I thought that was amazing. Uh, Joe Calzaret is the uh, point guy at Antietam, uh, the ranger in charge of other natural resources stuff, and that's a picture of him in 2009 helping uh, some of our school kids from Broadporting come and begin to plant. And, and Fill out this space. You can see we had not gotten all the way down to uh, Smoketown Road at that point. It was still pretty much, uh, I mean, I'd say maybe half or a quarter of the work had been done. Uh, they used a lot of bare root stock, which may look familiar to some of you. Uh, quite amazing for our kids that watch their eyes get real big. They'd never seen that many trees in such a small space before in their life. Um, and I love this picture because they were just having a ball, uh, you know, working hard in the hot sun. And behind them, all these trees coming up, and that's what it looks like today. I took that look. Um, the same fence, you can't see, I guess it's off the side there now. That fence is, those kids are sitting right about in the and they're just less than 10 years old. Uh, this is over in the Westwoods. These are, these are where we had failed to get the trees started before. Now you can see they're, they're, they're well established and they come along pretty good. This over to the south. Uh, we're, we're about this size when we were there like 15 years ago. This is down along the Antino Creek, just upstream from the uh, Burnside Bridge. Uh, one of the other rangers was helping us to, uh, set up some trees along here. This is to sort of put a buffer along the creek. Um, and uh, here we are, hard at work. Uh, I, I love my kids. Uh, um, this guy works for Bowman Trucking. He runs all their computer systems. He's in the trucking industry as a freight transfer guy. And he's worked for the Navy. Uh, that's about all I can say about him. <laughs> uh, he's got a very responsible job. Um, 
And there's, there's what it looks like uh, in 2016 when I went on a hike down there. These are the trees that we were planting uh, in, in back then, and that's what it looked like yesterday. Uh, so there, it's really coming into its own as a, as a full-fledged uh, forest. I, I paced off some of the trees down here. There were some tulips in there. There were 50 feet tall. Um, just amazing to see the changes and to see the changes in them. Um, I, get, I feel very privileged to be part of that. Um, anyway, uh, there are what they call witness trees, uh, the trees that were actually there at the time of the battle. This tree here is a sycamore, and it sits just upstream from the uh, Burnside Bridge on the low side, uh, the left-hand bank as you're going downstream. And there's a picture from 1862, and there's a picture from last year, not oh, earlier this year, actually. Um, and you can see how much that little tree has blossomed in gigantic tree. They spend an awful lot of work trying to make sure that tree stays there and stays there. Battlefield restoration is achievable. Clearly, we've been able to do some things that restore the battlefield to the way it looked at the time of the battle. Uh, and it certainly enhances uh, visitors' understanding and experience of the battle. When you're tromping through the woods and you break into an open field, you're getting the same experience they had in 1862. And that's a pretty cool thing to do. Um, that's why we have the battlefields, to be able to understand where great men did good things. Uh, sometimes horrible things, but uh, they gave us one country. Okay, so that's, that's it.